In this video, we will demonstrate to you the technique of performing a stretch pupilloplasty with the help of Y-shaped hooks. This patient with an advanced immature cataract is to undergo phaco emulsification surgery. The maximum pupillary diameter, as you can see, is no more than 4 mm. Let's see how we proceeded with this case, where we were able to achieve a significant and a satisfactory pupillary dilatation using two Y-shaped hooks. One has to be meticulous and pay great attention to detail during the wound construction of both the main incision as well as the paracentesis incisions. The next steps in order of sequence are staining with blue dye, washing out of the dye and then filling the anterior chamber with visco. Please ensure that you do not overfill the anterior chamber which would result in the iris bowing backwards which can endanger the anterior capsule during the pupillary stretch. Now these are the two Y-shaped hooks that we will use to create the pupillary stretch. Let's now understand how it is done. Now these are both the Y-shaped hooks. And this is the orientation when introduced into the eye. And once the pupil is hooked, it is this movement that results in a pupillary stretch. Let's watch this surgical maneuver. Under viscoelastic, both the hooks are introduced and turn by turn, each of the pupillary edges in the horizontal plane are hooked. And in a controlled manner, both the hooks are pushed to the opposite limbus. This results in a tear of the pupillary edge and a resultant pupillary dilatation. In order to augment this effect, the same technique is repeated, but this time in the vertical meridian. Let's now evaluate what was the eventual pupillary dilatation achieved. The pupil is now, as you can see, approximately 5 by 4 millimeters, which is not bad, but I don't think adequate. So the surgeon chooses to do another stretch. We'll shortly see the resultant pupillary dilatation after the second stretch. I think it's important to remember that whether you're using a pupillary dilating device or any other mechanical maneuver to open out the pupil, one maneuver or one technique should be adequate to give you a pupil large enough to comfortably perform the surgery. Now the pupil seems to be a lot larger, large enough to allow for a very comfortable phaco emulsification. When faced with a smaller pupil, I like to keep the capsular excess so that it is well within the pupillary margin. And where I find this helps is that when you end up using fluidic forces like performing hydrodissection, all of that causes minimum ruffling of the pupillary edge, which could further reduce the size of the pupil. The hydrodissection needs to be careful, slow and controlled. And once the surgeon confirms the rotation of the nucleus, you're ready to perform the nuclear emulsification. The following are the pointers when you're dealing with the nuclear emulsification. One, obviously, when you've got a small pupil, you've got a reduced area of working. So the only technique that will actually work is a direct chop because that ensures that whatever you need to do, you can do within the central four to five millimeters. Your phaco emulsification parameters should include energy just enough to impale and then emulsify the nuclear fragments. The vacuum and the flow are maintained at lower levels in order to have a more controlled nuclear emulsification. Moreover, it's wise to keep the probe slightly proximally because tending to keep it in its normal position somewhere at or slightly beyond the center might result in accidentally holding on to the pupillary edge. And whilst doing so, that is working proximally, you must ensure that accidentally the irrigation ports do not get trapped within the main incision because that could result in a problematic surge. And finally, if the pupil does seem to be getting smaller, one could actually inject a dispersive viscoelastic to achieve a viscomidriasis intraoperatively at any step. Coming to the irrigation aspiration. 
Bimanual irrigation aspiration is by far the most superior technique in my opinion to actually remove the cortex. Not only is it easier to remove the cortex circumferentially, but as you will see, the irrigation cannula acts as a retractor which aids visibility of the cortex which can sometimes be a problem in these small pupils. The only challenge with inserting the foldable IOL is that because of the limited visibility, you may need to confirm that the entire IOL is truly within the capsular bag. And since this was a hydro implantation of the IOL, there's hardly any necessity for a visco wash. At the end of irrigation aspiration, we injected a little pilocarpine washed it out again and completed the case by performing a stromal hydration. This was the end result at the end of the surgery. Tiny tears visible in the pupillary edge and a pupil that at the end of surgery did come down to about 3 to 4 millimeters. Now let's see what the patient looked like on day one post-op. And this is an image from the patient's eye on day one post-operatively. We've got a pupil that's come down to about possibly two and a half to three millimeters in size. You can still see the small micro tears in the pupil, but the patient was very comfortable and very satisfied. Thank you, and I hope this was a useful learning of how to manage a small pupil and the technique of a stretched pupiloplasty with Y-shaped hooks.